Welcome to section 13.3, biotechnology. Now, we've discussed a lot of these principles ahead of time. We've discussed genetic engineering, so I just want to make sure we're clear on what the end result of this is. And the end result of genetic engineering is typically something we call a transgenic organism. So this is an organism that contains DNA not just from its own species, but from something else as well. That's the idea that trans, that, you know, from something different. And so these are not going to be hybrids. It's not like you're going to get something weird like a centaur or something where it's half horse and half person. These are going to be something like the glowfish we talked about that ultimately just have one or at most a few genes that we have spliced in from something else. So they now have some type of relatively small ability that they previously lacked and could not have gotten through normal breeding. Now these can be a very big deal in terms of plants. You guys have heard about this in terms of genetically modified organisms. So GMOs are used to some extent in animals, but not near as much in terms of food sources. But in plants we see this used a lot. Now in some cases it's not quite as controversial because we're just doing something like the golden rice that we talked about that improves like the nutrition of something. But in other cases, we've made organisms produce substances that make them resistant to weed killers or that make them resistant to herbicides, pesticides in general. And some of these, there are people that are questioning the safety of. And so those you'll see are, are oftentimes on the news where they talk about GMO crops and are they safe and should they be grown and should people know whether or not they're eating them. Because for many crops, most of what's grown in the U.S. is genetically modified. Even for these supposedly more controversial changes that we make genetically, keep in mind their goal is still the same, and that's typically to increase the yield. And so by making crops where you can put down weed killer and kill all the weeds, you now have more of the nutrients in the soil that get to go to growing the actual plant, the crop. And so now we can grow these plants and we get much higher yields per acre. So sometimes when we start to get into having them produce substances that are a bit more artificial, that's where you tend to see a bit more of this controversy. But the scientists behind it are just trying to make sure we can feed everybody because we have a lot of people, a lot of mouths to feed, and we're ultimately trying to make sure that we can produce enough food to make that happen. Now I want to briefly bring up the Human Genome Project. I've talked about it before, where we went through, and originally it was five people, they sequenced every nucleotide they had. And I just want to bring this up because we talked about that they can ultimately find the genes by looking for those markers like the start and stop codons or the promoters and terminators that are before and after a gene. So we can use that to kind of figure out what genes are present within the human genome. And one of the cool things we've discovered is it's actually not much of our genome that the actual DNA that codes for proteins is a really, 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 really small amount. Now there's a bunch of other non-coding DNA that does serve a purpose. So this can be attachment purposes. It can allow some of those things we talked about with gene expression to attach that need to bind before or after genes to kind of signal what should happen. But because there's all this non-coding DNA, it also allows our bodies to have quite a bit of mutations relatively safely without causing any really big changes. And it's because of all this non-coding DNA that our DNA fingerprinting is so accurate. Because there's enough mutations that are going on and because most of them are in these non-coding regions, it's not normally as critical. So between individuals, we start to rapidly build up a lot of these changes. So when we do something like DNA fingerprinting, there are enough changes that have occurred to make sure that we don't get multiple people with the exact same DNA fingerprint. Now, one last technology I really want to discuss is just something called the DNA microarray. And these are kind of interesting because they're not focused so much on what genes you have. What they do is make this biochip, which is basically a chip that's got printed segments of DNA that are single-stranded. And so they go through and they take a bunch of genes and they print a chunk of those genes on a different square on this biochip that's got tons and tons of these little squares. That's what the little dots represent here. And then they go through and take the mRNA from an organism. They convert that to single-stranded DNA. Uh, we don't really have to get into how that process works, but ultimately they do. It's called complementary DNA. And then they tag it. So they make sure that that complementary DNA that they produced from the mRNA so remember, if we have mRNA, that means it's an express gene. So they're basically taking all of the expressed genes, converting them now to this single-stranded marked DNA. They then take this complementary DNA and they wash this biochip in it. They'll do this normally for comparison purposes. So they might take some disease tissue and they might take some healthy tissue. When they build the complementary DNA 
from the diseased tissue, they might use a red marker. Whereas when they're doing this for the healthy tissue, they use a green marker. They then take this biochip that's got this DNA stuck to it, essentially, and they scan it with lasers. And this allows them to determine which piece is stuck. So if you've got something where only the diseased tissue hasn't a gene active expressed, it would show up as red. If you've got stuff where only the healthy tissue has that gene expressed, it would show up green. And if both of them have this gene expressed, it would show up yellow. If neither of them have that expressed, it just doesn't show up. It just would look dark. So this allows for us to analyze what things like cancer or various diseases are doing to our genetics. So we can kind of see what genes are being turned on and off so we can try to understand better what is causing disease. And as we get better technology to ourselves turn genes on and off, we might be able to use some diplomacy and treat people that have certain diseases or disorders by going in and changing the gene expression to make the, the tissues go back to being healthy. And you can also identify changes that have occurred to certain genes when they undergo a single nucleotide polymorphism. So this is that common thing where we change one nucleotide. So usually it's substitution, but it could be addition, deletion, and then it ultimately causes us to get a new allele because this is how we get a lot of our diversity, is we have these small changes that cause these little shifts, but those little shifts can matter because in some cases they give us a brand new protein, or in some cases they give us a slightly altered older protein, but that slightly altered version could be a little better, a little worse, or it could make us have to treat someone different because it just responds differently to something like medication. Now this is just some quick terms in case you see them just to make sure you understand the basics. This is not meant to be some thorough overview. Uh, so genomics is when people study genomes. So this is basically studying the DNA that is in an organism or in a species. Whereas proteomics is studying the proteins that that genome is capable of producing. So these two are related, but they're kind of going in at opposite ends of the central dogma. One of them is saying, what's the DNA, kind of what could I do? Proteomics is saying, ultimately, what do we get? And this is critical because remember, a lot of the genomics is going to include these intron sequences. So we kind of need proteomics to realize what are the actual proteins so we can work our way back and figure out you know, what gene it's tied to and what chunks were removed to make this happen. You can't just say that a gene will always produce a specific protein because it gets spliced, it gets chunks removed. And we need to know what parts get edited out. Pharmacogenomics is kind of a big one now where this kind of looks at how pills, how medicines basically interact with individuals based on their particular genes. Because we know that certain individuals have side effects whereas others don't. We know some medications work for certain people, but for others they don't. So this field's trying to see if we can't eventually find out maybe some marker genes so that I could look and test for these genes and then know how you're likely to react to medicines so I can custom tailor the medicines I give to your particular genetics. Once again, this is also a ways out, but it is a field that shows lots of promise for your lifetimes, you know, so certainly 20 years, 30 years in the future. And then bioinformatics is one of the coolest where this is kind of like the Google of biology. You know, in biology, in chemistry, in physics, in science in general, we have so many people doing so many studies and gathering so much information that a big part now becomes making sure we can store and search it accurately so it's useful. And so they're trying to do much like what Google or search engines did for the web, where we have all these individual web pages, but now we need to find a way to connect and interact with them in a very organized, simple way. That's what bioinformatics is trying to do. And then lastly, what genetic technology discussion would be complete without talking at least briefly about cloning? So initially what we typically do is take an egg and we remove the nucleus. We then will take a normal somatic cell, so a body cell, so this could be like a skin cell, and we take the nucleus from that and insert it into that egg. So we now have a cell that was expecting to kind of grow up to be a full organism. We removed its nucleus and we added a different nucleus from an older cell, from a cell that you know, would not normally ever become a new individual. After we do this, we treat it with some chemicals, we give it a little shock to kind of make it forget what it was and start thinking, hey, I'm like a zygote, I should start growing. And that allows it to then go through and start doing cell division to get us to an embryo. Now at this stage, you could then implant that embryo via IVF, in vitro fertilization. You could essentially implant it into the waiting uterus of a female that you've set up as a surrogate, and you could grow it into a full-fledged individual. This is like Dolly the sheep, so this would be reproductive cloning. I'm trying to make an identical twin that's not the same age, 
essentially of a certain person. This one we don't really see with humans. This one has lots of ethical implications, certainly. We do see this in some cases with agriculture or with pets. But keep in mind, an identical twin is not going to be physically identical to you because gene expression will change a bit, and they're not going to have your memories. So this one ultimately is a letdown where some people think, you know, I'll clone my dog and I'll get Spot exactly how he was. But you get something that looks a lot like Spot, but could be completely different personality-wise. So it's a really crazy way to spend probably tens of thousands of dollars. But agriculturally, it gets a little bit more interesting if we could get it cheap, because we've talked about how they like the idea of having reliable offspring, of knowing what they're going to get. So if they could have some way of taking the best animals they have and getting exact copies of it, you'd probably have some people agriculturally interested. Now the other thing we can do is therapeutic cloning. Now therapeutic cloning is where we're, we're going to do the same process initially, but we're not going to try to grow a full individual. We're going to take these cells and try to treat them chemically to give them the right signals to make them differentiate to become a particular type of tissue. And so we can then try to make specific tissues work together to try to maybe grow even organs. So we're really trying to make spare parts. So I could ultimately try to say, I'm going to make some skin for you because you had bad burns, so we can add some of your own skin back to you to fix it. Or maybe you have cancer and your pancreas is currently being devoured by the cancer, if you will, and so you can't survive without that pancreas. But if I could keep you alive long enough to take some of your cells, give them the right signals, and grow a new pancreas, now you can survive. So therapeutic cloning is more focused on just making individual spare parts, which would be a huge boon for medicine, whereas we keep getting older and older, we find that we can use spare parts, and if we had those spare parts, we could live longer, healthier lives.